Welcome to the B'nai B'rith International Podcast. I'm CEO Dan Mariashin. Thank you for tuning in today. We know that the language that we choose is paramount when we talk about Israel and the Middle East. Author Lee Bender emphasizes this point in his book, Pressing Israel, Media Bias Exposed from A to Z, which he co-authored with Jerome Verlin. Lee has also written dozens of articles in local, national, and international publications on the topic of Israel. He's appeared as a guest on many radio programs and has spoken about anti-Israel bias at many schools, synagogues, churches, and synagogue groups. Lee helped develop the website factsonisrael.com to continue defending Israel from being maligned by false language. Lee is an attorney by training and now serves on various Jewish and civic-minded committees in the Philadelphia area where he lives. Lee, welcome to the podcast. Thank you very much, Dan. I appreciate having the opportunity to address your, uh, your B'nai B'rith audience. What, uh, what's prompting the, the use of this kind of language, and what prompted you to write about it and to do the book? Well, some years ago, uh, while I was an officer with the uh, Zionist Organization of America, which I still am, a gentleman who I met there who is considerably older than me, actually uh, close to 80 right now, uh, more like my father's age, uh, came up to me and said, you know, um, I think uh, I'm going to be writing a book about uh, Israel and uh, media bias, and I know that you have a tremendous interest in it. Would you like to join me in writing the book? Now, that's a tremendous opportunity when someone asks you to write a book with them. And it's something that I have been, have been thinking about for a long time myself. Uh, we both had an, an interest in understanding how important language is. I mean, as Jews, of course, we all know how important words are, meanings of words. That's in the Torah, it's in the Bible, in the Talmud. Uh, words have tremendous meaning, and if they are maligned, or misunderstood and mischaracterized, then that can cause tremendous problems, issues, and concerns. So we have we found a local publisher, actually another gentleman who is uh, very active in Jewish organizations, and he said, I'll publish it. So I mean, we had the publisher, we had authors, and then we put the book together in about a, a year's period of time. But the emphasis, as you say, is language. And our motto is, if you forfeit the language, you forfeit our heritage and our history. So that is the thrust of the book, because, as you said, and uh, as you have said, it's it, it's important to understand how language has been used against us, and how we also, as Jews, and this is another important thrust of our argument, do not understand what's being done against us, and are using language impertinently, which is causing us to not be able to defend Israel and the Jewish people and our rights as well. This has really been an issue from, uh, really, from the get-go. Uh, over the 71 years of modern uh, Israel's existence, um, media bias uh, has, uh, has been there all the way through. What, what prompts this? I'm not asking a rhetorical question because, you know, you would think, um, you know, over 70 years, uh, um, some of this would, would subside, uh, especially in, if we can call it, the Internet era, the modern era, where more information is available. Uh, why, why now? Why is this particularly a, a problem now after so many years? I consider it that there are people who are out and out anti-Semites. You're never going to reach them. But there are others who are in the middle who either are apathetic, ignorant, just don't understand the issues, but in fact have been co-opted these days by the fact that they perceive the Jews uh, with envy and jealousy and the success of their tiny little state, which is the size of the state of New Jersey, essentially, that's sitting amongst uh, 21 Arab countries that out uh, that outpopulate uh, Israel by a ratio of about 400 to 1. It is unbelievable that in their eyes and in the eyes of Islamic fundamentalists that Israel is still permitted to be there and thrive and win wars against these people. So this has come to a head, I think, at this point, because Israel is a regional power. It's considered one of the most uh, militarily sophisticated powers in the world. But more importantly, Israel is a humanitarian 
power as well and is on the front lines of first responders around the world helping others uh, in Africa, in, uh, in Haiti, even in Iran. But what's going on today is a movement against the Jewish people that is morphing anti-Zionism into anti-Semitism. And that is co-opting the language of human rights, which is all kind of swirled up into this whole thing. Maybe we can talk about that in a moment. Maybe you can ask me a specific question. Yeah, no, I'd like to, what, what, what I'd like to do is um, let's go through the, you know, a list, and it'll be a representative list because uh, the book is, is filled with examples. But, I mean, I'm one example that I see all the time is I've noticed even over a period of time, at one time, um, the media, and I say the media broadly and not citing specifics, but just for purposes of discussion, the word terrorist used to be used um, quite frequently when terrorists would carry out acts of terror, acts of violence. Now we see militant. They're militants. Um, give us give us some other, it's kind of a, you know, it's kind of neutral. Uh, you could be militant about something. You could be militant about about anything. Um, so why not uh, why not about uh, terror? And and it's I think it's such such an egregious uh, mischaracterization of of the word. So give us some other examples uh, that that you see and that you've been battling against and that you talk about in the book. Sure, uh, and I agree with you 100 percent that the term militant is used by many mainstream media outlets to describe somebody who is carrying out a terrorist attack, but they're not actually in military uniform, but they're considered a militant rather than a terrorist. But here are some of the major terms that we, we are constantly uh, fighting against and having to fight against, even, with on, uh, even amongst our own people. Uh, I cringe when I hear the term East Jerusalem, with a capital E, as if Jerusalem was a divided city. It has never been a divided city, except for the 19 years from 1948 to 1967, when Jordan illegally occupied what's also called now the West Bank, which is another horrible term. So the West Bank was coined by Jordan in the early 1950s to disassociate the Jewish connection to the land. You should never say West Bank. We see that all the time. Even Israelis, I talk to them. They say, well, you know, we know it. that's shorthand for Judea and Samaria. Judea and Samaria are the actual terms that even the United Nations used in 1947, the whole country of Judea, because that's what it was known as. It's not just the biblical term, which I sometimes see the newspapers try to say, oh, BB. Netanyahu, oh, look, he used a biblical term for Judea and Samaria. No, that's the West Bank. Bad term. Another bad term, settlements, as if Jews don't have the right to live anywhere. But Arabs, they're considered living in neighborhoods, towns, and villages. Uh, another term is occupation. You know, an occupied West Bank, occupied East Jerusalem, occupied, occupied. Well, by definition, you don't occupy land that is yours to begin with. And we can go back into history, but a lot of people don't even care about the history. But the fact is that uh, there is no occupation uh, that Israel claimed and acquired much of the land in defensive wars and under international law has an opportunity has an has an obligation and rights to that land. And if at some point there's ever going to be a peace process that uh, Israel determines that it's in its best interest to negotiate, uh, give up some of that potential that's up to Israel, but it's not occupied. Let's remember, the Arabs never, ever ruled the area of Palestine for one day in history. And they never occupied it, uh, except by coming there when the Jews started uh, making the land flourish uh, in the uh, late 19th, uh, uh, late 20th century. So, um, you know that's what these are another these are these are terms that I find very distressing. Uh, Temple Mount also many times is given up. Uh, we give up the term Temple Mount and it's Haram al-Sharif, which is the Arab term. Another here's a big one. Here's a really big one. The Palestinians. Who are the Palestinians? Now originally, if you went back in the 1920s and 30s, you asked an Arab are they Palestinian, they'd say no. I'm a South Syrian, I'm an Arab, I'm not a Palestinian, that's the Jews. That was a term for the Jews. We gave up that term. I call them not the Palestinians, 
the Palestinian Arabs, because that's who they are, the Palestinian Arabs. We are Israelis and Jews now, you know, not Jews, we are Israelis uh, in Israel, but to give up the term the Palestinians, that's granting them rights that they never had or secured. And of course, the term Palestine is itself a, a funny term for the Palestinian Arabs to want to co-op, because that's a term that the Romans used over 2,000 years ago to disassociate the land of the Jews and uh, to rename it essentially after one of the Jews' greatest enemies, the Philistines, who have no connection whatsoever to today's Palestinian Arabs. Well, so today, just some clear examples. Today, our um, uh, dominating this discussion uh, is the BDS movement, the Boycott, Divestment, and Sanctions movement, and um, those who um, um, who originated this this movement against Israel uh, to boycott Israel have their own. Uh, terminology that that they use. Um, what have you been watching uh, with regard to to the BDS movement? Well, that comes into something that we were discussing a little earlier. This whole concept of human rights and boycotting and it's nonviolent. But if you understand and know who the founders of BDS are, and I have that on my website www.factsonisrael.com. We have a lot of information about that and uh, videos uh, that we produce as well, you understand who were the founders of the BDS movement and what their goal was. The goal was not simply a nonviolent boycott of like South Africa back you know, in, in, you know, 30, 40 years ago. Their goal was to destroy Israel from within. That is still the goal of BDS, even though they kind of try to hide it uh, from the, the public. That's their goal. So they wrap this around language that is using human rights terms uh, and, and civil rights. And the Palestinian Arabs, or of course they call them the Palestinians, are being subjugated by Israel. Uh, Palestinians uh, have to go through checkpoints, and they are not allowed to live as, uh, as full-fledged citizens. And what is such a farce about all this is that the media never goes into the fact that 95% of all Palestinian Arabs today are governed by the Palestinian Authority. Uh, and so that's a civil government that they elect. And that's not even counting Gaza. And let's not also forget the fact that the big 800-pound uh, elephant in the room is that the Palestinian Arabs have uh, rejected peace with Israel, a state of their own, next to Israel, not instead of Israel, next to Israel, six times since 1937. It's never brought up by the media. Israel has offered an opportunity for a Palestinian Arab state within the confines of what is the Western Palestine, from the Pal original Palestine mandate. Remember the Palestine mandate, which was the British were permitted by the League of Nations uh, as the European powers were carving up the Middle East after the Ottoman Empire uh, was uh, was defeated in, after World War One, France gets a whole bunch of territory in Syria and other places. In, and uh, one of the areas that the British got to uh, uh, control was the area of Palestine, the Palestine Mandate. And yet, in 1922, only two years after they got the mandate, they lopped off the. Uh, uh, eastern portion of 78% of the eastern portion of the Palestine Mandate. That, that is all the land uh, east of the Jordan River to create a fake state. Why well, say fake state? Because they put the Hashemite Kingdom, who were uh, the Hashemites, were not even uh, local uh, members or tribesmen of the area, and installed the king there. And that was, and that is what I say today is the two-state solution. We can get to that in a moment. I wrote a big article about that with with my partner Jerry Verlin. And we're really pushing that now, uh, but uh, because we think that's a, a big answer to the issues with regard to peace in the Middle East. But getting back to the story about the BDS, you know, they make it seem like all they want to do is uh, to simply boycott and sanction Israel for their behavior. In fact, there have been many times when Arab leaders have said, "Don't do this because you are destroying." Uh, the ability of our Arab citizens to have jobs in Israel. And one of the main 
uh, arguments, and one of the main examples I can cite to you uh, within the last few years is a very successful Israeli company called SodaStream, which I love, by the way. And, uh, SodaStream is a company that makes uh, allows people at home to make their own seltzer water. And SodaStream had a location, I think, in a, a suburb of, of Jerusalem called Ma'ale Adumim. And there they employed about 500 Arabs uh, who were making good wages. You know, and that's the other thing. People don't realize that Israel employs many hundreds and hundreds of thousands of Palestinian Arabs who work jointly in Israel. Well, what happened is the BDS movement put so much pressure on SodaStream that they moved their operations inside Israel, and therefore these people lost their jobs. That's just one little example of how the BDS movement is so pernicious. They do not care about the welfare of Palestinian Arabs. They care only about destroying Israel. So we are, we're living in a time where uh, people basically are saying, don't confuse me with the facts. Um, I mean, it's clear that uh, this kind of language continues to not only have a life of its own, but um, seems to be very pronounced in, in coverage that, that we see every day. And we know that there are organizations out there, um, the work that you're doing, that CAMERA does, uh, Honest Reporting, um, and, and others, um, that try to respond when this mischaracterization of language is used. What, how, how will we uh, accomplish, and this is so widespread, um, you know, I know that we, we do our best to, to make it clear um, when uh, language is, is misused, um, and I'm sure, and, and many others do as well. But how do, we, how do we win this battle? We are trying, at least amongst us, uh, you know, my, Jerry Verlin and myself, uh, and our publisher, Steve Crane, uh, we're just trying at least to get the Jewish community to pay attention. And I can tell you, by relentless pressure over the years, I have been able to successfully get certain uh, writers and authors to say, you know what, you're right, we shouldn't be using West Bank. I'm not going to use that term anymore. I'm not going to use the term settlements. And so if you suddenly can do that, uh, you might be, have a chance. Uh, but overall, the mainstream media, the New York Times, for instance, uh, they're not going to necessarily pay attention if you write a letter to the editor. Uh, letters to the editors are nice and helpful, or corrections. But um, ultimately, that's not going to be the answer. I think uh, we learned over the years that trying to pressure newspapers by withholding advertising dollars, and pressuring the advertisers, many who might have been wealthy Jewish business people, that might have had a slight impact. But um, frankly, yeah, it is a very difficult proposition. We also are trying very effectively, and I know B'nai B'rith does as well, to make sure that our uh, Congress people and government are aware of all of this. And, and I praise the Lord every day that we have a Congress that for the most part is pro-Israel, pro-democracy, and understands Israel's predicament and that Israel is an asset and an ally of the United States. So we are very fortunate in that regard. Uh, but uh, it is, you're right, it is how to fight back. Uh, there are ways we do that. I write articles. We uh, go to uh, speaking engagements. Uh, I've been on radio with a lot of Christian uh, uh, broadcasters who reach tremendous audiences. Uh, and uh, that's a whole different kettle of fish. And we, we're very fortunate that we should have our Christian evangelical friends who support the Jewish people in the state of Israel. And not getting into philosophical differences, which I've gotten into with people who say, how could you associate with people like that? I say, you know what? What do you think the Jewish population is in this country? It's less than 2% now. It's been shrinking. Without the support of these people and, uh, and uh, with the government and uh, influence, we would be in very dire straits. Well, just to go back to the, to the battle, you know, it's interesting that uh, the more things change, the more they stay the same. When I uh, entered this, this field, this career, um, more than 40 years ago, um, writing letters to the editor was a, a very big part 
of um, the agenda for uh, Jewish public policy organizations uh, to, uh, to set the record straight. Now we have a modern, um, uh, kind of a modern face of the old letter to the editor. It's the comments that, that appear on the Internet. Um, and getting, getting one's arms around the Internet um, is not impossible, um, as long as there are people there who, uh, who are able to, uh, to respond immediately to uh, mischaracterizations uh, that they see. But I believe uh, that the large media organizations, uh, you know, it's, speaking truth to power um, is still very much um, needed, as it was over 40 years ago, except the, the, the modes are different, the means are different. But speaking truth to power and saying, look, you, you made a mistake. You, you, you said this was, you used this word, uh, you mischaracterized it. Um, this is not the way it is. Here are the facts. And I think that the more of us who engage in this kind of, of activity, uh, the better. And I agree with you completely that um, we look to allies outside of the Jewish community, people who care very deeply about Israel, also you know, care at the same time very much about the truth. And so um, the, the kind of you know, work that you're doing, um, together with, with others who are really dedicated to um, calling out these situations, is, uh, is certainly um, something to, to, to be uh, commended. Uh, what do we lose when we lose, this, lose our narrative in this process? What's, what's the downside of all of this? Other than, I mean, the obvious is that the situation in terms of of Israel's standing and the press and so forth um, is, is always uh, uh, difficult for us. But in, over the long haul, looking ahead, wh- what's, the, what's the, the downside here of, of, of this, uh, this kind of narrative? Well, let me go back to something you said, which reminded me. Um, very important. I agree with you speaking truth to power. Uh, and for the most part, I really believe that most journalists want to get it right. They want to be honest. They want the facts. Some are lazy with regard to Israel because they just get the narrative. But what is important, and I have done this several times now over the years, our local paper in Philadelphia is the Philadelphia Inquirer. Generally speaking, had not been a particularly pro-Israel paper from perspectives of op-ed writers, or even we found just articles that are uh, reproduced from the AP of Reuters, where they changed the, the, the uh, you'll see the same picture. Uh, there was one famous picture we, which we have uh, of, of two soldiers standing in front of, uh, one says Haram al-Sharif, and the other says the Temple Mount. And the inquiry changed it to Haram al-Sharif rather than Temple Mount. So we've had an opportunity to meet with the editors and the publishers of the paper. Several times I've done this over the years. And just to point out with the concrete examples, because you just can't talk in, uh, you know, in general, generalities, how this is hurtful to a community. In Philadelphia, we have about 200 to 250,000 Jews. It's one of the larger communities. I said, yeah, you're missing a lot of stories here. A lot of the stories that you're covering are only about the negatives that Israel does. And that's one of the things we try to emphasize is the positives. Okay, Israel is a, a you know, innovation technology discovery is on the cutting edge, as you know, of biotechnology, security, computer tech. Uh, military as well, water, and, and shares with the world all those things. This is our Jewish values. We should be proud of that. And to answer your question, that's what we were giving up. We will give up our Jewish values if we don't continue to fight and extol Israel's positive. Now, Israel's not a perfect country, and neither does the United States. We know this. But Israel's trying under some very difficult circumstances in a very hostile neighborhood to do the best it can. And frankly, most most Arabs who live within Israel would never want to be part of a Palestinian state if there ever was one, rather than living amongst the Israelis who give them some of the highest quality of education, opportunities, business, health care. Now, is it perfect? No, it's not perfect. Uh, do they get the services that they deserve? Maybe not in the same proportion, but we certainly have problems like that in this country, and we've been around for 240 years or so. So that's what we've given up. But I emphasize that we are always trying to extol Israel's positives, and these, these reflect our Jewish values. You know, there's just one other uh, area that, that we didn't talk about but uh, we're, because we're running out of time here, but 
um, editorial cartoons um, have been, uh, over the years, uh, a tremendous problem in terms of, um, of how Israelis, um, Israeli soldiers um, and uh, um, uh, Israeli leaders uh, are depicted in, in editorial cartoons. Uh, we, we see that right to the, to the present day. It continues to be uh, an issue, including one that the New York Times uh, uh, had to, to pull back, the international edition of the New York Times, just, uh, just a few short weeks ago. So unfortunately, unfortunately, uh, there's no shortage of, of these um, uh, cartoons and no shortage of, uh, again, the mischaracterization of language uh, that um, that confront us uh, really every day. But uh, Lee, your uh, your book, which is pressing Israel, media bias exposed from A to Z, and it is from A to Z in the book. Uh, the book is by Lee Bender and Jerome Verlin. Uh, it uh, tells the story of language and uh, the Israeli-Palestinian issue, and certainly uh, worth reading. Uh, Lee, thank you very much uh, for joining us today. I appreciate the opportunity. Thank you, Dan. And thank you, everyone, for listening to our podcast. Please visit our website, b'nebrith.org, like our Facebook page, follow us on Twitter, subscribe on your smartphone through the podcast app for iPhone or through Google Play for Android. And lastly, tell a friend about us. For my guest, Lee Bender, I'm Dan Mary Ashen. We'll talk to you next time on the B'nai B'rith International Podcast. Thank you.